Education meeting yes, back to order at uh, 1239. And first up, we have public participation. But where did I lose Marilyn? Wait, don't we have to? Oh, she's rounding up Kathy. She's doing your Becky. Part of that looks. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know how to start the clock, too? <laughs> so we have Mike. Oh, here she comes. All right. <laughs> I started to, but you're here, so. Okay. Um, I don't know. Did you tell them five minutes? Nope. Nope. Go ahead. Okay. So we're going to go into public participation. Each person is given five minutes of time to address the board on whatever subject um, they so desire. The board does not engage in a back and forth conversation at this time. They may choose to contact you later. Um, I will tell you who is the first person up and who's on deck, um, even though baseball season is over. Mike Libby is first, and he will be followed by Rebecca Bush. So if you come to the end of the table, we will be ready whenever you are. Playoffs is still going on. Yeah, my baseball season is yeah, sure over, can. as far as we're mm -hmm. concerned. <laughs> oh, oh. oh. You see that one beam or whatever uh, Simba <laughs> says to the Lion King? Dad, what are the playoffs? And he says, you don't need to know. You're just a cub. Nice introduction Dr. Libby got there. Yes, yes, All right, really. please. Not, not a Cubs fan. Not Pretty much not a fan of anything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> my, my name is Mike Libby. I'm a professor of geography at Central Michigan University and co-coordinator of the Michigan Geographic Alliance. I'm here today to talk about the process of revising social studies standards. This is counting the national standards process, my fourth effort through this. After the last one, I swore I was going to retire before the next one. But um, I have participated in this. This has been by far the most collegial and inclusive of all of the projects I've participated in. We have had a variety of people involved. We had content area committees looking at the standards. Our charge was fewer, clearer, and higher, and to look at the standards through the lens of C3, not adopt it. But that was a good decision. Uh, we have done that. Uh, it went through a whole series of things. Carol Egbo uh, uh, was in deeply involved in coordinating the standards. Uh, other Amy Bloom unfortunately dropped off the leadership committee early, but she has continued to make very constructive comments uh, to us through the, through the process. Uh, we have gone out for public testimony, uh, and uh, it has been collegial and positive, and people from all sides of the political spectrum have commented uh, with uh, what I perceive to be a substantial degree of collegiality and professionalism. Uh, virtually everyone who's commented has had a, a, a reasonable point uh, to make, which we have tried to respond to. Uh, there are some people who said uh, we were inconsistent in our use of the terms democracy and constitutional republic. Uh, I think we're going to be able to clarify that. They're both appropriated in some different areas. There were some people who were very interested more on genocide. We've had it in a couple places. They had some people who were more interested in civil rights material. Uh, we've also had people who were not in favor of either of those. So uh, it's been a, a very positive process. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about um, the handout I have just, just given you because it demonstrates what we have, have done. Uh, in terms of specifically taking a look at the process skills that are to cut across the content standards. And I want to do this because one of the concerns has been uh, C3, how much we're using from C3, how much a national organization is influencing our process. And I can, I can show you where that influence has been. The first page is what is, is in our existing standards. 
it was included only once, only for secondary. And as you read through this, a lot of the general knowledge stuff is already included in our, our standards. The disciplinary knowledge stuff is pretty much included in our standards and seem to be repetitive. The middle three are really where the core of social studies processes are. So we looked at those with the intent of making them fewer, clearer, higher. In the C3 document, they focused particularly on the idea of developing compelling questions and supporting questions. A compelling question leads to an argument or uh, an issue or a persuasive essay. A supporting question leads to evidence or, or, or support. We thought it was a good idea to be more specific about including those terms. So what you have on the second three pages is our Michigan process standards, which we thought from the C3, and which was strongly advocated for by Amy Bloom, by the way, that we needed a process, we needed to, to have them not just in secondary, but also in elementary and middle school, made more grade appropriate. If you look under inquiry, research, and analysis in P21 and P22, you will see the terms compelling and supporting questions. We thought that was a positive addition we could get from C3. That is the extent of the contribution C3 made to these process standards. Uh, and uh, I, hope, I hope when you get concerns about that, you'll be able to refer to this as, as how we've used Michigan standards and modified them in an appropriate way. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank here. You. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is Rebecca Bush, and she will be followed by John Bracey. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Bush. I'm here today on behalf of the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association. I am currently the chair, um, entering my third year as the chair of that organization. And I cannot underscore enough um, Dr. Libby's comments about how collegial the entire content expectation updating process was. Um, continues to be. We have several <coughs> colleges and, and university folks that are represented. We have a, a, a huge number of teachers that are representative of this work that was put forward. Um, we have consultants from around the state that have worked on it. We have had several members of all of our social studies organizations, Michigan Council for Social Studies, as well as some of the other content organizations. Um, and as an ISD um, social studies consultant, I have to tell you that so far our comments that we have received um, throughout our county um, and some of our, our neighboring counties have been nothing but positive. Um, when teachers look at those content expectation updates, they are extremely positive and optimistic and hopeful um, as far as really helping to make the shift that is so necessary right now for our students in social studies to instead of memorizing content and memorizing factual information to be able to take it to a more rigorous step and that's what the work has done um, it's an extremely important and impactful set of content expectations that was done with a lot of collaboration um, K-12 and continues to be. So on behalf of the social studies supervisors who have been at every step along the way in the process, um, we would also really like to, to thank um, the, the folks at MDE for the process that we followed for the process that has ensued with receiving public feedback from around the state um, from the multiple opportunities that our teachers have had to take a look at those draft documents and to make some very pointed and important comments 
that elicit some very positive feedback. Thank you. Thank you for Thank being you. here and sharing. Our next speaker is John Bracey, and he will be followed by Hattie McGuire. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here again. Um, and first, I want to say uh, I'm John Bracey. I'm the executive director for the State of Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Uh, this is Chad Badgero, our education programs uh, manager. And uh, again, I like to come every year and sort of update you on what our impact and our efforts have been um, in the realm of arts education. And first, quickly, uh, uh, apologies to Eileen because last year she suggested that we do a, a larger project or larger uh, presentation to you, and we haven't been able to get on that agenda. So I am trying, but I don't want to go, uh, you know, more than a year without telling you what our efforts have actually been. So sort of sharing, and um, and I will say, even though uh, our partnership uh, with the Department of Education isn't what it was, say, you know. A dozen years or so ago uh, we do do some work uh, there's a, a program for example that we're partnering with you um, and the Americans for the Arts called SP3 which is state pilot policy program um, a couple of uh, um, Mary head and Megan um, Schrauben. Schrauben and I think uh, board member Austin are also serve on, on that panel for uh, with Americans for the Arts which is really really pretty interesting uh, so, um, we have several programs that are geared specifically toward arts education across the state, working primarily with arts organizations, but also some with schools. Uh, I'll tell you right now the two programs that you may be most interested in uh, are our Bus Trek Grant Program and our Arts Equipment and Supplies Program. That, that's new this year, uh, or was new in Fiscal 15. Those programs we have yet to accept applications for for fiscal 2016. So, but the 15 numbers were really telling. Um, uh, we were able to take out of our budget, which uh, uh, again isn't what it used to be, of course. Um, but we we awarded um, sixty thousand dollars in field trip grants. These are these are grants that are up to five hundred dollars for teachers or schools to take a field trip to an arts and cultural organization. Uh, Everything from the Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point to Michigan Opera Theater. It really just sort of covers, helps cover transportation costs. Um, with the, the bus track grants this past year, the, we impacted 50, over 15,000 students were able to take a field trip with the, those grants. Uh, they represented 43 counties. Um, even though the request level was probably uh, double what we could actually uh, afford to supply in terms of grants. Mm -hmm. The arts equipment grants, we discovered that um, in, in some of our research that very often arts instructors were some of the first teachers reaching into their pocket to buy those supplies or, or to try to um, get some equipment or in one school's case to fix, fix some equipment that they've never been able to budget for to uh, repair, which were French horns that they couldn't repair the pads on. They didn't have the budget. So we created this program where a school or teacher can apply for up to $2,500 uh, to purchase art supplies or equipment or to repair equipment within their school. Um, again, we, uh, we, this is a reimbursement type of program, so we weren't really sure how that was going to work in this pilot year. Uh, but we awarded $40,000 even though we had nearly $130,000 in requests. Uh, 43 schools in 23 counties were able to either purchase supplies or equipment. So uh, we're really excited about that program as well. Our primary program with, um, in, in arts education is our residency program. Um, this past year, or this current year for fiscal 16, the council just awarded 25 artists and residencies to schools. Uh, those schools um, are going to receive uh, up to 30 contact hours from a professional artist in, in totaling awards of uh, $285,000 and some change. Um, this, uh, this is a, a, a growing program. We uh, had just over $700,000 in requests for this program. Um, 
It's, it's becoming more popular all the time. It, it's increasing. It's up again 27% this year from the, the past year, and that growth line has been um, solid, solid that way. The other program that we have uh, that focuses on uh, education is the uh, is a, a projects program that's education based and that's for schools or or perhaps municipalities or, or some other organization that does an arts education project uh, and we made nearly uh, two hundred thousand dollars in those type of grants reaching kids and uh, and learners of all ages so I just want you to know that you you do have a potential partner in the in the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and uh, even though I have yet to meet the new superintendent, I know you know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hattie McGuire, and she will be followed by Linda Malaren. We're ready whenever you are. Thanks for giving me some time to talk to you. I'm Hattie McGuire. I'm a National Board Certified English Teacher at Novi High School, and I'm here as a member of the Network of Michigan Educators to talk about a success story we've had at Novi High School. When I thought about what I wanted to talk about today, I was a little nervous because I was worried it would sound too small and it wasn't exciting enough. But that's why I want to talk about it. It's a very small thing we've done at Novi High School that's had a big impact on our students. What I want to talk about is independent reading. In 2012, I read the book Read Aside by Kelly Gallagher. And in it, he contends that in our rush to uh, raise student achievement scores and to close achievement gaps, in our rush to get kids career and college ready, we're forgetting to help them prepare to be in independent, lifelong readers. <laughs> when we pick a text <coughs> apart in class, or we give them only teacher-centered texts, uh, they, we are killing their love for reading. And the big problem with that is that they never become real lifelong readers. If you look at that little handout I gave you, on the right hand side there's some really shocking little graph there. A kid that reads 13 minutes a day ends up seeing about 600,000 words over the course of a year. A kid that reads 90 minutes a day sees almost 5 million words. That's a huge gap. And we end up with kids that have this huge amount of word poverty. And those are the kids that are struggling to make the big growth that we need them to make. So one of the biggest things we need to do is find a way to make them want to read. You can't get to that 90 minutes a day if you don't want to do it. So our English department did a book study of Read Aside, and we decided we needed to change the culture of reading at our school. And the way we decided to do it was very small, 10 minutes a day, nothing more than 10 minutes. Um, I gave you kind of a timeline of what we did over the past four years on that handout, but I'm going to skip ahead and tell you what we did today, where we're at today in Novi. Today, if you go into Novi High School, every student in the whole building has his or her own independent novel that they've chosen. You see kids reading in lots of different places. Not all of them. I, we're not quite there at 100% yet. But you see kids reading in other classes. Our library is a checkout central, according to our librarian. In class, every English class, every day, no exceptions, kids get 10 minutes at least to read. And the teachers read too. We think that's a huge part of the, the success of this is our students see us as reader. So we don't take attendance during that time. We're not grading papers. We're showing them that we value that reading time too. And the kids are reading a lot. Last year, one of our English teachers in the freshman class took, uh, she took a tally of how many books her kids read. By the end of the year, they'd read 522 novels. It's about five books on average per kid, in addition to the texts that they already were reading in class. And so on those texts in class, we haven't completely abandoned class texts. You still need those, too. But we're working really hard to make those more student interest driven and diverse texts. Our 11th grade uh, teachers wrote a grant and got some additional texts for their class that would be higher student interest texts. And then we've moved it beyond just the English department. Our entire building has now embraced this idea that literacy is key to moving that needle up for kids. And so our whole building is committed the past two years to concentrated work in every department on literacy instruction and opportunities, regardless of what core content area it is in there. So our next step is to look at bigger data. We've got tons and tons of anecdotal evidence. We have all kinds of kids that will say, oh, I never used to read before, and I read four books this year. That's great, but we want to see if it's showing in our test scores, too. 
So we have in-house common assessments at Novi. We've started to look at those numbers and see if we're having uh, an impact there. The English 10 classes, uh, they're the ones that have been doing this the longest. We looked at our scores on our final exam last year and realized it might not be challenging enough anymore, which was super exciting, especially in the area of vocabulary decoding for new words. So kids are better able at the end of the class now than they were three years ago to decode words that they've never seen before. We think that's a direct correlation between how much more they're reading. So that's really exciting and we're hoping to see more of that in the years to come as we continue looking at the data. So I hope our 10 minute little look at Novi is, is something that was interesting to you and our P, your peek into our writing world has been informative. We'd love to have you come read with us anytime. Just bring a book or we'll help you find one. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Our next speaker is Linda Melarani, and please correct me on the pronunciation of your name, and she will be followed by Mike Scheiber. You got it right the second time. Melarani? Yes. <laughs> Good. I am here today on behalf of the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. As some, if not all of you, are aware, the Senate Judiciary Committee is taking testimony this afternoon on Senate Bill 442. This bill would make it legal to carry a concealed weapon in schools, daycare centers, bars, stadiums, entertainment venues seating more than 2,500, places of worship, hospitals, dorms, and classrooms at universities and community colleges. We strongly oppose this bill and will be providing testimony to the committee this afternoon. Experience in other states has shown that when gun laws are weakened, there are more gun deaths. When gun laws are strengthened, gun deaths are not eliminated, but they are reduced. We believe the proliferation of guns in daily life increases citizens' risk of death and injury. We believe it is the function of security in school buildings and the police for the, po for the population in general, not individual citizens, to safeguard the general public and the students in our state schools and universities. We hope you can support um, uh, the opposition to Senate Bill 442. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I believe our last speaker is Mike Scheibler, unless someone else has a form. What's coming up? Good afternoon. My name is Mike Scheibler. I'm superintendent of schools of the Rockford Public Schools in Kent County. Uh, just to give you a background, I've been an educator in the state of Michigan over 47 years. I started teaching in 1968 over in Warren Consolidated Schools. I've been a superintendent of Rockford. It's my second superintendency uh, for 27 years. And so I've been here for a while. I kind of get what's going on, I think. I could tell you this, that, uh, and I'm going to speak on Senate Bill 442. Uh, obviously, we're adamantly against this bill. I want to make it really clear that guns have no purpose in schools, no purpose really in public arenas of any kind. I also want to make it clear that I am not against people having guns for sport, protection, uh, for hunting. I'm certainly not against people having CPLs, concealed pistol. Uh, opportunities to carry uh, if in fact they're using it for the appropriate reasons. But I am absolutely against the possession of guns in schools, daycare centers, stadiums, entertainment venues, uh, places of worship, hospitals, dorms, and colleges, and universities, and so forth. The Rockford Public Schools has made it clear that uh, all of our elementary schools, which are eight of them, our two middle schools, our freshman center, and our high school are weapon-free zones. And I have red signs with white lettering posted on the side of every building saying weapon-free zone. As superintendent of schools in Rockford, I am responsible for the safety of 8,000 kids, 1,000 employees, uh, parents, and the community. 
and I take that job very seriously, and I would imagine every superintendent in the state does that as well. But I cannot expect an employee of our buildings, uh, for, for example, secretary, to be able to identify and accurately assess a person coming into our building as to their mental or emotional state of mind. A Senate Bill 442 would allow anyone with a licensed concealed weapon permit to keep that weapon concealed into all those venues I just mentioned. Uh, that's just inappropriate. Advocates for concealed weapons in public places state that, well, if they have a gun, they would be able to prevent uh, other tragedies that have occurred in the past. Well, I've talked to everybody from Secret Service, FBI, state police, county, and local, and every one of the professional experts that I talked to have clearly said to me they do not want some type of a position or experience that we're describing under 442, Senate Bill 442, to happen. In fact, they tell me if they come into a building where there's a shooter, they're not going to have the time to ask, are you a concealed weapon permit holder? Or are you the bad guy? And in fact, they'll just start shooting. And this is coming from people who are, in fact, experts in the field. In Rockford, we have done the following many things to protect our students. In 1998, I established a, a security department for Rockford. Now, this is a suburban school district right outside of Grand Rapids. And I hired 12 people, former law enforcement professionals, to protect our buildings. Uh, with budget cuts in 2008, we went down to eight of those people. But they're still in place, and they're still working. We, have, we are constantly training our staff and, uh, to deal with emergency situations and how to react to, to those situations. As recently as last summer, we trained all of our staff, again, in emergency protocol. 2014, we passed the $76 million bond issue. Of that $76 million, $11 million is going to security. And for the last seven months, we constructed security vestibules in every one of our buildings. Shatterproof glass. You walk in there. You don't go any further than until you're allowed to go further into the building. And so you can see something like that is going to protect as best we can. And it's never 100% foolproof to protect our our kids and our staff. I will be speaking today at this hearing uh, at 3 o'clock, and I'll be urging the Senate Judiciary Committee to vote this down without it going to the Senate. But if it goes to the Senate, and if it goes to the House, I can assure you that educators throughout the state will be working hard uh, to defeat any type of a bill that would provide open uh, concealed weapon carry in all these locations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker of the day is Kate White. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kate White, and I'm with Michigan Community Action. And I'm here today um, partly because of Pamela Pugh requested me to come and tell you a little bit about our efforts to try to reduce poverty in Michigan and to offer our services of our network to help you and in your interest in fighting poverty in the communities of Michigan. Community Action are designated geographic zones around the state where we have nonprofits and, and county-based organizations that are fighting poverty. And we know that your work is dedicated to educating children and adults. But we also know that one of the challenges is we hope that education will solve poverty. Sometimes when people are so poor and they enter a classroom, they don't have the tools they need and they're not ready to learn. So we would like, as Community Action Network, to be a partner and a resource to the Board of Education and the whole educational system to help prevent poverty amongst families. I want to thank you for your work today. I know that it's hard to see poverty in the midst of all of the other objectives that you're trying to achieve while you're trying to educate families. Community action agencies around our state are doing innovative programs to solve hunger, to solve homelessness, to provide emergency housing, to provide transportation, <coughs> to provide job training, to provide skills and supports for adult learners, trying to help people get back into the workforce 
and of course they're integral in providing Head Start, early Head Start, and early on services in our communities. So we hope that you'll consider community action as you make your plans and go forward. One of the wonderful things about community action that's similar to the Board of Education is that we are very locally driven. And all of our community action boards are created of one third of actual citizens in the community that would benefit from our programs and services, a third are elected officials, and a third are other community leaders. All of our work is driven by community needs assessments, and all of our work is measured in terms of outcomes, trying to alleviate poverty. So I brought some resources for you today, and I also brought you lists of the community action agencies in your communities. I hope that you'll consider community action as you try to make a difference in your community and look at it not just as the very local resources for your schools and school districts, but when you're thinking about policy changes <clears throat> and if you need feedback on how that would impact the poor or ways that we can take the resources that we have, which we all know are, are scarce and are in demand, to try to partner those resources with the human service resources that we receive in our state to try to help families piece together all of the supports they need to be able to be successful at, in education as well as in life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you. you want to just leave that there? We'll I'm get it. Happy to and pass it out to everybody. Set it in two stacks so it doesn't slide all around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brian? Yep. Can we just mention real quick for those who came to talk about uh, Senate Bill 442, which is the concealed weapons, we will be talking about that very shortly, so you might want to stick around for a little bit. Thank you. All right, that concludes public comment. So next, we're going to introduce some new departmental employees very quickly. We'd like to introduce the new employees who have joined us, and Kyle, I think you're going first. Yes, thanks, Brian. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, Mary Ann Smith with the Library of Michigan. Mary, could you stand up and just tell me a little bit about yourself and your role at the library? Sure. I'm Mary Ann Smith. I am working at the Statewide Library Services on the fifth floor of the library, the State Library. And um, I'm working on conferences and also traveling with Ben. It's very interesting and learning a lot. Welcome. Norma Jean? And I'd like to. Um, Welcome and introduce Andrea Nessel in the Office of Field Services. Andrea? Hi, Andrea Nessel, of course, Office of Field Services. I'm a consultant with Legion 2, and my teammates and I serve districts on the west side of the state, and we work with them with technical assistance and support as they uh, complete their consolidated applications for their grant money and work with them on programming and making sure they're following the federal regulations for their grant money. Prior to that, I've been in the public school system for 20 years as a principal and assistant principal at elementary, middle, and high school. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I'd like to introduce Tamara Smollett from our uh, Office of Standards and Assessment. Hi, I'm Tamara Smollett. Um, I hail from Michigan State most recently, working on my PhD in science education. I am now in the Office of Assessment, working as a science education research consultant. So for Thank you for me. Welcome. Susan? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce Bethany Kramer, who just started with us in the child and development care and probably has one of the toughest jobs in the department. Do you want to tell them what you do? Well, still learning. My name is Bethany Kramer. Um, I am in the Office of Great Start as the financial analyst for the Child Development and Care Grant. Um, really still learning it all as I came as a grant accountant from Community Health and so just trying to get Welcome to the department. Welcome. The last item on the Community of the Whole agenda is the presentation of Michigan winners of the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. The Presidential Awards for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching are the nation's highest honors for teachers of math <laughs> and science. These teachers uh, will spend the next year serving as mod uh, models for their colleagues, inspiration to their communities, and leaders in the improvement of mathematic and science education. We've had the privilege of meeting Luke Wilcox before, back in June when he was a finalist for the Michigan Teacher of the Year, and we're all happy to welcome him back today. Uh, Linda. Thank you. Uh, some of you may be looking at the title on this and saying 2013, really? Are you serious? It appears that the um, process at the national level 
is a bit out of sync right now, and so <laughs> Luke is indeed the 2013 winner, um, but that was just announced recently. So it's, um, we're not out of sync as far as the paperwork is concerned. So one of the great pleasures of my job is that we get to celebrate teachers and the fine things that they do, and every June I get to come to you with, with one of those celebrations, but it's just great fun today to be able to introduce you to, again, Luke Wilcox, who has become the Presidential Award winner in math, and he has a few things he'd like to share with you. Sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me. It's wonderful to be back here, um, you know, just a couple of months later and to see some familiar faces and also to see some new faces here, which is wonderful. Um, and as I, re I reflect on uh, that whole Michigan Teacher of the Year process, uh, I realize that none of that uh, would have happened at all without this Presidential Award. And so I'd like to just share a few of my experiences dealing with the Presidential Award uh, and also to tell you a little bit about my trip to Washington, D.C. this past summer. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll take you back to the beginning where I was first nominated for the Presidential Award. And, um, you know, at first I had no idea what it was all about and I started to look into it. It looks kind of neat. But there's this lengthy application process that uh, honestly was kind of intimidating to me. And so I spoke to some of my colleagues and some of my colleagues kind of urged me and pushed me to go, go, go through with it. And uh, what I found was that I had to do a lot more writing than I'm used to doing as a math teacher. And uh, in that writing, I really got an opportunity to reflect uh, on my teaching and reflect on uh, my career. And this is just one of those things that as teachers, we often don't have time to do because we're so stuck in the day-to-day -day of getting lessons ready and grading quizzes and tests. And so for me to actually take the opportunity to do some reflecting about my instruction uh, was just uh, incredible for me and in, in, in my career. And, and uh, so I, I wrote my essays. I worked with my English teachers to rewrite my essays and rewrite my <laughs> essays and rewrite my essays. Uh, and then uh, another component is to, uh, to uh, videotape a, a lesson that you teach. And so I did a, a cross-curricular lesson where I took my AP statistics students into the AP biology classroom. And my students actually worked with the biology students to um, analyze some data that they had collected from an experiment. They were growing some uh, plants and uh, and so we videotaped that lesson. I got an opportunity to reflect on that lesson and do some writing on that lesson. And one real big, uh, I guess, uh, bonus or, or help for me was that in the application process, the state of Michigan now has uh, mentors that help presidential award uh, applicants through, through the application process. So I said, yes, please, I would love to have an, a, a mentor. And so I got an email back uh, very shortly thereafter from a, a guy named Dwight Seagreen, who happens to be a 1992 presidential award winner. Uh, and the crazy thing is that Dwight C. Green, or maybe I should say Mr. C. Green, was my seventh grade science Aww. teacher. Aww. <laughs> and somebody who I really looked up to was a phenomenal, I mean, is a phenomenal educator. And so I got the opportunity to work with somebody who I, I really looked up to when I was young. And uh, so I listened to everything he had to say. And he opened my eyes up to this world of education, which I didn't even know existed because I'd been so focused on my classroom for, for 10 years and didn't realize there was all this other cool stuff happening in education outside of my view. And he, he has done some incredible things. He's been in, to South America to just study frogs and he's in California doing a conference and he's in Texas and he's going to all these different places. And, and I, was, I was just inspired. Like, I, I want to do all of that stuff. And so everything he told me to do, I, I did it. You know, he said, join the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics. Go to conferences. Speak at conferences. Do professional development with your staff. And so I've spent the last three years really pursuing a lot of those things that he inspired me to do. And so when I found out that I won the award, um, after a phone call to my wife first, he was, he was the first one that I called. And uh, he, he was just thrilled and I was thrilled that I, I, could, I could say that I had won it. Um, and so uh, as part of the recognition process, you go to Washington DC for four days. And so my wife and I spent four days there this past summer. And uh, in those four days, I got an opportunity to meet with Senator Debbie Stabenow uh, and actually talk some education policy. Uh, we got to visit the Capitol. And then, of course, the highlight of the whole trip was the, the visit to the White House, where we spent the, the full day in the White House, and I shook hands with the President of the United States. And I'll tell you, I, I never thought as a public school math teacher that I would ever have the opportunity, let alone to be in the White House, to be able to shake hands with the President of the United States. And I know that that's something that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life as, as just a highlight of, of my career. And so I also got the opportunity to meet all the other presidential award winners uh, throughout the country. And so we're talking the best 
math and science teachers in the country. And uh, now I have access to all of those people. And we have a community, and we have a Facebook group, and I, I have access to all of these people. And the other opportunities that I've been afforded just through uh, the inspiration of Dwight Seagreen, uh, such as the Michigan Teacher of the Year program, uh, I've met some wonderful educators like the one sitting at the table here who I now have as part of my network. And so in my reflection on like the whole process, the, the, the two things that I think I valued the most about it, number one was that I got an opportunity to be reflective about my practice as a teacher. Uh, but number two, the, the network that has been opened up to me and some of the opportunities through those networks uh, is just incredible. And so I hope to, in the future, continue to grow my leadership, uh, my teacher leadership skills, and uh, I hope to be involved as part of the conversation uh, when educational decisions are being made. And, and I hope that I can bring uh, to the table the perspective of the teacher who's in the classroom every day, who's working with the students, and working with uh, a variety of different students. I'm from Kentwood Public Schools, and if you know anything about Kentwood, we have a very, very diverse student body there. And so uh, I hope to continue to grow my teacher leadership and, and provide uh, the teacher voice in, into the conversation. Thanks. Right, I think your students are very lucky to have you. Certainly, congratulations to you, and thank you for what you do and the difference you make each day in the lives of students. Thank you. Should I ask a question? Sure. Uh, there was an, art, an interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times yesterday about you, recreational math and the importance of teaching, recre using recreational math to entice children to be interested in math. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, so well, I, my experience in that is with my two young children that I have who are seven and four. And of course, being a math teacher, I'm, I'm the one that f is the first one to see something mathematical in, in what we do. And so uh, for me as a parent, that's something that I try and interject into, you know, family dinners, walks out at the park, you know, rides on the bike and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I mean, that's always about, uh, you know, what do, what do students think about math? And generally, when you ask students what they think about math, it's not like good. It. They're afraid of math. They, <laughs> they don't like it. And so... Uh, I, I think that we have a lot of uh, we, we have a lot of growth to make in that in that uh, respect, and um, to to me, it's about making it contextual. Like there's a story to it, so it's not just X's and Y's and what you guys remember from algebra class that you hated. That there's a story to be told with it, and so I mean maybe that fits in with the idea of the recreational math is that we need to make sure that uh, the math that we're teaching is involved in some sort of context that there is a story to go along with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love math, by the way. So. Yes. <laughs> hey, I like this new superintendent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, and thank keep you. up the great thank work. You. Thanks, Luke. Congratulations. So next, uh, I've been asked to move up the state and federal legislative update, and so yeah, we'll, we'll have Marty come up, and then certainly Cassandra has some things as well. <laughs> Positively, I mean. <laughs> sure. At least you didn't say I have issues this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sure she forgot about that. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> well, the whole, the, Thank you, Cassandra. There's a whole maize and blue issue we have. To yeah. Yeah. Go blue. Go blue. <laughs> Wait, did you change? I did not. No. I didn't notice this before. Yes, it's been blue. It's all maize day. and blue. No, not maize. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I worry just because I was sure you were going to go green and white on I me believe today. green, but not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, the uh, Legislative Committee met on October 5th, uh, discussed several pieces of legislation that are actually moving. The, um, there's a uh, House Bill 4822, which is the third grade literacy bill that's on the floor of the House. Senate Bill 103, the Educator Evaluation Bill that's on the floor of the House. And then there's another piece of legislation uh, with the House Bill 4261 that was discussed at length. And um, we have created, not we, the, the committee has created some statements to discuss. And I believe Mertz has copies of, there's copies of the statements behind you. All right. <laughs> With the yep, we can start with concealed weapons. Actually, it's a whole package, so yeah. you'll have them all. All three, are, all three are connected together, are stable together. When you want it, when you want to talk about, about them, they'll be right in front of you. Thank you. Thanks, 
So it's the third page there that you yeah. want to start with. Did you, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, Marty, okay. I'll defer to you. So there are, like Marty said, there's three um, items that the legislative committee wanted to bring forth to the full committee or to the full board today. And uh, we're going to start with the third one since um, we've had some public participation regarding this um, already this afternoon. Um, this, just in way of introduction, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, because I've spent the last 15 years working on colleges and university campuses. And I am now at a community college responsible for things like the crisis communication plan. And, uh, and this is something, unfortunately, I have to spend way too much time thinking about what happens when someone comes on campus mm -hmm. with a weapon, uh, whether the intent is good or bad. Um, there's a reaction that happens as a result of that. And so I have requested that we come up with a statement um, doing two things, really. One, supporting a piece of legislation that would actually end the loophole for open carry on, um, no, uh, on weapon-free zones, essentially. And the second is opposing the piece of legislation that's being discussed <laughs> today, which would allow concealed carry uh, in those weapon-free zones. Um, so the draft statement that you have before you reads, that the State Board of Education is committed to the safety of all Michigan school children, with the exception of law enforcement and school security personnel trained in the use of weapons to protect public safety. It is our firm belief that dangerous weapons, such as handguns and assault rifles, have no place in schools. Allowing weapons on school grounds only increases fear on the part of students and staff and increases the chances of a catastrophic incident. As such, the State Board of Education supports the passage of House Bill 4261, a bill to eliminate the open carry loophole that currently exists in law. Furthermore, the State Board of Education opposes Senate Bill 442, which will allow concealed firearms to be carried on school grounds by anyone with a license to carry a concealed weapon. And with that, uh, I would ask for a motion to... Um, to so moved. Yes. Second. It's been moved and supported. Discussion? John? Yeah. I very much support this. Uh, as you know, we've been following this discussion for a while. We thought, I hope this was not a serious effort to allow guns in schools, but it clearly it is. Um, and I think most gun owners, most gun carriers, most Second Amendment advocates uh, believe there are certain places where there shouldn't be guns. There's no place for guns in schools. I think most would agree around school children. And I totally agree with Cassandra. Uh, if guns are around, it's more likely that a gun is going to be used, even by accident, and somebody's going to get hurt. And this argument that we're seeing being made that somehow if there are more people with guns, they would uh, protect our kids from uh, attack. I mean, uh, is this the okay corral, and are we relying on vigilantes to protect our school children? Uh, vigilantes make mistakes. You know, you saw the discussion about some self um, appointed vigilante shooting at shoplifters coming out of Home Depot. I mean, this just uh, will not work. And we heard the eloquent testimony from Mike uh, Scheibler and, and others about um, law enforcement officials viewing more guns in the hands of folks protecting from other guns as a recipe for disaster. So I would strongly urge that we uh, approve the motion and I very much appreciate Cassandra and others' um, development of, of the. Any other? Kathleen and then Richard? I strongly support the statement. I, it's absolutely essential, I think, that we take a position in opposing any weapons in schools. It, uh, to me, it's absolutely beyond belief that people think that's a good idea. So I, I'm really, the latest incident, there were several of the, all the people at that Umpqua Community College. Then there were two incidents in, in Arizona and Texas with more shooting and more deaths. It's just incredible. And uh, we just have to take a stand in opposing any kind of weapons in schools. So I strongly support this, and I was very eager to take a position on it. <laughs> Richard, please, and then Lupe. Well, it's no accident that a lot of these school shootings have taken place where guns are outlawed and only the outlaw has a gun. 
Uh, personally, I think this measure is uh, the issue that this measure addresses is left to the local school. They know the culture, they know uh, the safety, they know whether it's more dangerous to, more likely to have an injury due to an accident with a gun than uh, due to violence. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm going to vote uh, against this particular uh, resolution. Not because I'm convinced that the state Senate bill is, is correct, I'm just not sure that we can uh, speak across the board for every school culture in Michigan. Thank you, Richard. Luba, and then Eileen. <clears throat> well, I am very uh, much in support of, of the statement that we're uh, discussing here today. Uh, as a former teacher and principal, and so on and so on for the many years that I taught in schools, there's no way that I can visualize a, a building, when I was the principal of a building, people coming in with, with weapons, whether it be concealed or open carry. Uh, I, I see that they are a detriment to uh, the culture of any school, any school. Children should not be exposed to weapons. Uh, I worked in schools where weapons were used in their homes, drive-by shootings, and those are the pictures that these children had in their brains. So if they saw these weapons in the schools, it would even be more detriment to their, to their safety as they felt it. So uh, guns in schools are absolutely a no. And we're not saying that people cannot own guns, that's not the issue here. The issue here is that weapons do not belong in schools. And, and that's the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, please. And then Rick. Uh, Rick. So I, I have a unique perspective on this because of course I have a child who was guarded by men with, uh, with Kalishnikovs for three years of his life. And uh, uh, I, like Richard, um, am concerned about constitutional rights and community mores. I, like Lupe, cannot imagine somebody walking into a school with a gun on their hip. Or I, I've been there. So. Uh, uh, I will be voting for this, but the clash of constitutional rights uh, versus uh, children's rights is definitely there. And uh, uh, I also think that this is not the place for guns. It's a personal, personal as opposed to constitutional or legal interpretation. Correct, please. As a classroom teacher, I like to believe that I, I base my practice on evidence. And the evidence that I've read and that I've seen and the commentary that I've heard espouses the fact that, or the reality that um, the presence of guns in schools is not a detriment to these kinds of mass shootings and that there are other mechanisms and other policies that need to be in place, um, both at the federal, perhaps federal, state, and local levels in order to prevent the kinds of shootings that we've seen and that have become sort of de rigueur in our country. So I would definitely support this um, statement as written. Seeing no further discussion, a motion has been made, seconded, and discussed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 7-1. Next item, please, Cassandra. Thank you. The next item uh, that we'd like to bring to your attention is in regards to the third grade reading bill. Uh, we had a lot of conversation about this bill. In fact, um, I think we're about to have even more conversation because there's uh, some suggestions on ways we could actually improve the legislation. Um, essentially, uh, I, I will read the statement, but essentially um, what we're saying here is that there's a lot of good stuff in this bill, a lot of things that we really like, um, but there are many of us that have uh, real um, concerns about a state mandated retention piece of the bill. Um, so the, the the statement reads, uh, the State Board of Education believes that reading at grade level is an important part of a student's successful education. House Bill 4822 has the potential to aid the Michigan Department of Education, schools, administrators, teachers, and parents in moving the needle forward on reading proficiency for the children in our state. The current bill initiates many education strategies aimed at supporting and improving the necessary work for all Michigan children to read at grade level by the end of third grade. 
These positive strategies include comprehensive core classroom reading instruction, early literacy coaches, reading intervention programs in gates, grades K through 3, summer reading camps, diagnostic reading assessments, and recognition of developmental obstacles in reading. While the State Board of Education is a strong supporter of these positive strategies, the board remains opposed to the concept of smart promotion slash retention, which currently remains in the bill. While there are situations where retaining students in their current grade is warranted, that decision needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis between teachers and parents. It should not be automatic. And the State Board of Education urges members of the state legislature to provide the supports and positive strategies to help all students read at grade level without the mandate of grade retention that is currently that currently is written in House Bill 4822. Is there a motion to approve? I would so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion, please. Eileen? Uh, I've sent the board a letter uh, saying that I couldn't vote for this policy, uh, this statement as is, and at lunch today, um, listened to the superintendent describe what Dearborn has put into place, which, if I have it correctly, um, uh, is a, an interesting compromise. In my eyes, uh, uh, retention has to remain on the table because this state has fallen behind year after year after year on NAEP and our own internal MEEP scores have shown the same results. Uh, we don't know what MSTEP shows yet. So uh, from what I understand or from what I could see happening, I would propose that we consider uh, asking uh, the uh, House to recraft a section of the bill that would provide uh, Michigan Department of Education oversight on district retention policies that have to be submitted to us for approval to ensure that proper student evaluation and additional intervention along with family involvement um, uh, uh, would take place. Um, should districts not provide that, that mandatory, retire or re mandatory retention would be required. And this would um, cause, I think, this would, this would give uh, a similar support mechanism that the House has proposed, which is that there are um, uh, uh, things that need to be done for th third graders when they reach the point where they are still a year to a year and a half behind. And I think you said the Dearborn policy was a year. Educators have expressed to me in the past that up to a year and a half is something that is fairly normal developmentally. Uh, what, I'm what I'm trying to point out is that there need to, needs to be some teeth to this. There are a ton of new requirements going into place, which for many districts are very far away from the uh, approaches and the intervention strategies that they're using now. Uh, we've heard, I've heard personally that a number of districts aren't using anything that's research-based for evaluating children. And our goal here should be to help children. Um, I don't want to get stuck on whether we're being unfair to districts. What I need us to be is fair to children uh, and give every child the opportunity to be reading at grade level. They've got story problems coming up, social studies, uh, all manner of things that have to have reading comprehension in fourth grade. Not giving them the chance to be able to do that well is short-sighted and our dropout rates show it. So are you making a motion to amend this and adding your statement? I think I am. The problem would be that I'm not sure I have the wording down correctly, and I think that if, if we could hammer that out, uh, uh, we would at least know whether the board could agree on it. And it would be based on what you were able to do in Dearborn. Okay, John? Um, and I'm not sure if, um, how you might articulate that, but I guess I would, before we decide that way to go, I would just like to to be different observation, different recommendation. Um, I mean, from the get-go, we and certainly the advocates of this legislation, all of them have wanted to say and insist that we as a state help all kids learn at third grade uh, level uh, on time. Um, it's, it's gone, this bill has evolved a lot from something that first appeared to be just make that demand and mandate or they're retained um, without providing the tools and help and support that help deliver on that expectation. And it's really come a long way towards providing lots of important tools and supports and aids that help kids hit that mark, which we must help them do. Um, so I compliment uh, legislators and Amanda Price and others for that. And Karen, with the governor's office, who's not here, we were talking at lunch, was they haven't taken a formal position, but she was uh, describing that there are important tangible tools and enablers in this legislation that do a lot of good things to help all kids read at third grade level. Um, so on the mandatory retention piece, I still don't necessarily think we 
uh, I don't support a mandatory retention. I think the goal of this legislation, as it is now, is to help us deliver on that goal of helping all kids read at third grade. Locals can still retain kids. It should be a local decision about how they manage that. I think if, uh, as I understand, the legislature is, some are saying we have to have that kind of stick or this won't work. Um, I'm for us supporting this statement. Uh, I would, uh, we could add a sentence, Eileen, potentially that would say, um, should legislation, in, should legislation that includes mandatory retention be, uh, be moved? Here's some recommendations on best practice ways to do that. That would be more helpful than hurtful. You know, some, I'm not sure how to do that, but I appreciate also your um, looking for a formula that um, delivers on the promise of helping kids le read at third grade level and tries to qualify or work with this accountability provision in some way that's constructive, not destructive. I still think it's sort of a destructive to have that. You can't mandate kids to read. We have to do all the things to help them to read, and that's where we are for the most part in this bill now. Richard, please. Um, I should know this, but uh, how do we determine uh, third grade uh, reading level is that the middle of the third grade is it the what you're supposed to know by the end of third grade um, uh, is a child reading in the second month of uh, third grade uh, regarded as reading on the third grade level and can go on to fourth grade or uh, how, how is that determined number Jean the, the end of third grade would be the, the benchmark with that because you want to make sure that they've had that full year and if you're saying as the legislature the legislation says that they cannot go on to fourth grade so they have to have so at the end of third grade, grade they'd have to be at that reading level yeah, be within a year of that and so, how so then it's how June, does that June? standard compare right, with probably. the statistical average So what do you mean, how does which compare, how that end? Say your question. Well, we have a third grade reading standard, mm -hmm. and how does that compare with the average reading achievement of kids at the end of third grade? Mm -hmm. Well, technically, now with our new standards, the board adopted in 2010, we actually have English language, language arts standards. We don't have reading standards anymore. And so um, the way it, it's... This is what gets a little complicated with this bill and with this discussion is what makes intuitive sense to people is the idea that there is like a bucket of learning that you get <laughs> and you're either all the way, you know, you're some percentage of the way through the bucket. Right. But really the way standards are set up is it's not, you can have achieved like a proficient level on the standards and still have more to develop. Sure. It's not quite, it, it's not, it doesn't correlate to your question. I'm trying to figure out how to answer your statistical average question. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of having kids Proficient in ELA by the end of third grade, and if, if our goal is having all kids proficient in ELA or have acquired enough of the standards to be on track, you know, be able to move forward, and how that compares with our average, I think the we don't have the MSTEP data, uh, the MEEP data, the NAEP data would say we aren't where we need to be. So this is a, an aspirational goal. This is a thing that we would need to work toward. Is that kind of what you're asking about? Well, the average. The average reading ability of a child at the end of third grade mm -hmm. is is what means that half the kids wouldn't go on. Right, okay. and that's and that's why our standards are built on standards acquisition. Not they're not normative. It's a criteria. So right. there are things that kids need to know and do. And but that standards acquisition will some percentage of kids will fall presumably fall below it, and we can predict that ten percent or twenty percent of the kids won't will not have attained that standard by the end of third grade. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, we can't, we will be able to. It's hard right now without the new MSTEP data because that's yeah. really, because then we even have to get into what percentage of kids are not proficient across all of the ELA standards. There's four claims within ELA. And then looking specifically at the reading claim, asking the question, um, if this is how many kids are, have enough reading to be totally on track, this is, this is how many kids do not have enough and are definitely in trouble. There's actually a middle ground where they're not all the way to where we need them to be, but they're... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we will have all that data, but I don't have a good answer for you now. My guess is that number that really are 
not anywhere near where they need to be is a relatively small percentage. Uh, states like Ohio that have done this have found it to be in the three to four percent, five percent range. But then there's that middle part that we certainly have to still address. But they're they're not um, they're movable with some um, targeted interventions, I guess. Okay, thank you. Like a lot of great ideas, it, it seems like the devil is in the detail. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So John, uh, did some? Oh, I'm sorry, Michelle. I had, I just had some questions. So I, I see in the third paragraph, um, it refers to the bill recognizing developmental obstacles in reading. Um, and I guess it's to you, Marty. Um, mm -hmm. Do they actually, besides recognizing, do they actually have resources or programming to, like for dyslexia, for instance, um, to address and to, um, to actually help them read? So if they have an IEP, um, do they just get passed along, or are there? Uh, is it re is it mandatory to provide them? Uh, program. I know. I know. The, it's up to the IEP to decide. But right. um, is there anything legislatively that reinforces that they, that they are supposed to get what they need to be able to read? And and I'm looking. I'm thinking specifically of dyslexia because I'm told that there's. They often. Um, it's very expensive to diagnose, and even when they have an outside diagnosis, they might not. They might not be successful in getting an IEP, so I'm concerned about that that group. Is there is there anything in there besides saying we will recognize it? Is there anything to address those concerns? Well, well the legislation talks about having programs and opportunities to have support for the kids who aren't meeting the standard. So, does, and it's, but it doesn't make any specific reference to dyslexia, like we no. have the, uh, the reading disability. No. Okay. Um, that's going to, and I, I also wanted to just share um, a conversation that I had with someone from the uh, Florida Education Association, their education policy director, because there's often references made to uh, Florida doing this and, um, and being cited as a success story. And she said um, that it was a, it's, it's, it's some, sometimes the statistics are used in a misleading way. For instance, they say that people refer to how the fourth grade uh, reading is improved. Well, she said, of course the fourth grade reading scores will improve because you're holding back all the third graders who aren't doing well, so it's going to automatically give you, and it's sort of a, a false um, a sense of success due to that policy, but it's not really a success. It's just the, the, they're not being tested with the fourth grade. Um, and uh, also that the, the advances or that bump up they get in the fourth grade is usually disappears by the eighth grade and that by the twelfth grade um, the, they reg the, the state regresses on their reading scores. Um, so over the long term, is it really an effective, does it really get at what we're trying to get at? Um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a regression, if it's just, um, I mean I think we should look at the evidence to whether it's really effective in ha helping students you know, graduate uh, you know, with uh, better skills and higher standards. If it's there's also no study in in uh, Florida so far, although there's been calls for it, to look at the impact of the ki on the kids who are retained and how that affects them uh, as far as being uh, dropping out. There's no study. Uh, the state has the Department of Ed, as I understand it, is not collecting the data to even have uh, folks look at that, and that that's would be a very interesting uh, data that I think would be very informative, but uh, unfortunately it, it's not available. So. so Michelle, I think you've made some good points that I want to respond to. F first of all, having a guidepost or a stick in the ground that says third grade reading is important and making sure districts are reporting to kids and families on what their students are at at grade level and what we're doing to get them, I think will lead to improved reading scores. But the focus has to be preschool through 12th grade. We can't just stop here in third grade. So certainly the promising practices and the work the department is going to share with school districts is going to be what we need to be doing preschool through 12th grade, reading, writing across the curriculum so that you not only get that growth for third grade or fourth grade, but it continues to grow as you work through the grades. I agree with you, if we absolutely just put a flag in the ground and say third grade is it, and that's all we do, we may or may not get growth. I think we'd get a little growth but we're not going to sustain it. So we have to focus, regardless of what the legislature does, we need to focus preschool through 12th grade 
on reading and writing across the curriculum and sharing those promising practices with districts and really uh, focus them looking at preschool through 12th grade. Kathleen? Well, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you said what you said now, Brian, because I was concerned about that too, that badly, you know, the legislature might say, well, we took care of it. Everybody's supposed to be able to read and we don't have to do anything else. And it isn't true. <laughs> it is not true. So uh, I, I want to put the emphasis on, uh, it's a con continuum through, through the entire school experience. And reading should be something that they that other teachers focus on as well, just not the first three years. So that's very important. The other thing is that Rick told us that today, and I had heard this before, that uh, Patricia Palacchio, who's got her name, uh, didn't learn to read till she was, the, she was 14. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I've, I've talked to parents whose kids didn't learn to read until they were in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I support this because we more or less, it's, it's an issue that we have to, we can't just ignore, I don't think. <coughs> but I, I don't want people to think that that's, there aren't exceptions to this. Not everybody, no matter how, what intervention we do, is going to be able to read by, this, by the third, end of the third grade. And they end up being very successful. Yeah. Right, and they turn out to be fine, mm -hmm. upstanding citizens who could read at everything. I have Eileen and then Richard. So I'm, I'm not talking about, I have, a, I have a kid who's dysgraphic, and it didn't hurt him the way that dyslexia would, but it, it continually hampers him. And fortunately, he's been in places where people have been able to reach out and to do something constructive. You know, also, the math, pro math processing disorder, but we're not talking about math. Um, I'm talking about the kids who aren't getting help. I'm talking about the districts wh which have not taken the initiative to do things that are available to them. I'm talking about the children we're losing every single year. And what I'm anxious about with this uh, statement is it sends a signal um, uh, that, that I want this statement to, to be uh, something that shows our passion for those children, not for worrying about their social and emotional well-being if they um, mo can't move up with their cohort. It's a, it's a great statement, but I think the situation that we're in right now calls for something stronger. So uh, I'm anxious to see the statement and to see the kind of uh, a sentence that uh, John was saying could be put in. But the reality for me is I'm not seeing the urgency from this board with that statement. I see it in our conversations. I hear it every day. I know that we're all there. I, you know, I hear it in the comments that are being made at the board table right now. But I'm really anxious that we acknowledge the urgency of the situation. I'm going to go to Richard and then Cassandra. When, when you're I done, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes, sentence for you. So, I'm waiting with bated breath for once. <laughs> All right, Richard, then Cassandra. You could have had one. Too. I just wanted to, um, I guess, belabor the obvious to some of us and, and may be overlooked by others. You know, the nature of reading instruction changes from third grade to fourth grade. Uh, the first three years, you, you concentrate on word attack skills and mastering a certain number of, of uh, sight words, and then uh, with those skills behind you, then you work on fluency and, and vocabulary expansion and that sort of thing in the upper grades. That's why the, that's why the break is put at third grade, because then you have another chance to reinforce those skills that presumably haven't been mastered going on. Um, just wanted to throw that out. Cassandra, please. So I think what this statement makes clear is that we're not saying we're opposed to retention per se. We're opposed to state-mandated retention, or at least that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so here's my potential solution, and you tell me if it gets to what you're talking about. At the end of the fourth paragraph, um, the one that starts, while the State Board of Education, uh, I would recommend adding a sentence that would read, um, while there are situations where retaining students and their current grade is warranted, that decision needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis between teachers and parents. It should not be automatic. Instead of requiring retention at the state level, the SBE recommends requiring local districts to develop a local plan related to retention and promotion, which shall be appoint approved by the Michigan Department of Education. And that's what I was proposing at lunch. Um, uh, what's the alternative if they don't develop it? Well, if it's in law, 
they have to develop it. And what happens if it's half-baked and we know it's not going to get them any place? Well, it sounds like the uh, way that's written, does it give me the authority to approve or not approve? It should. I okay. mean, that's the only way I right. would, that's the only right. way so that I would So if we approve don't this. approve it, then we tell them what they have to but do to fix we're, it. We're just if they don't do anything, I think we have a... Have to do wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. If, we, if they don't do it, I think there's penalties in the school aid for not following the law that could be issued. Can we check on that? Because the, the, that, that is, that's what's driving me. I, I want to put together a bill that has the supports, has the, has the, um, the uh, focus on uh, uh, better practices, better techniques, and make sure that these kids actually get to third grade with this either resolved or a solid, solid plan for it to, to, to be resolved. If that's not in there, or if there's a loophole, then we're going to be right where we are now with every district that's not doing this. It'll, it'll take years and decades as opposed to year, months and years. So do we, do we want to right, have an amendment? The solution, yeah. Mm -hmm. but could you it's add, called Dan Varner. Could you add the <laughs> word enforceable to part of your language? Well, that so it just gives us, make sure that, but there is a way to enforce something like Sandra's narrative. So we make sure that that was fully developed. I don't know developed. where I would, you tell me where to add that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I had down. You could put it in. in I, I had something that started, should districts not provide an appropriate retention policy uh, for uh, MDE approval? Well, you could say the, say the SBA rec recommends legislation that, that develops an enforceable requirement on local districts to develop a local plan. Da, 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 da. Oh, enforceable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's and That's there's a lot of ways that could be accomplished. Yeah. He's got the authority. If they don't do it, there's penalty. I mean, all right, so is there a motion to laws? add this? I'm, I'm sorry, so they would say through existing laws or new, or, or new legislation, something like that. Okay, so um, is there a motion to accept the amendment? Ex a motion. I mean, <laughs> All right, so moved and supported. <laughs> so first, first uh, <laughs> voting on the amendment. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment? Yeah, I would. Well, could you read it? want to read it again? <laughs> yeah, I'll read the whole <laughs> paragraph so you yeah, guys understand yeah, the context yeah, yeah. in which it's... The paragraph will read, while the State Board of Education is a strong supporter of these positive strategies, the board remains opposed to the concept of smart promotion slash retention, which currently remains in the bill. While there are situations where retaining students in their current grade is warranted, that decision needs to be, a de needs to be decided typo, mm -hmm. on a case-by-case -case basis between teachers and parents. It should not be automatic. Instead of requiring retention at the state level, the SBE recommends requiring local districts to develop an enforceable local plan related to retention and promotion, which shall be approved by the Michigan Department of Education. Okay, so voting on that amendment only. I, okay, I, I would amend one word in the previous sentence. Instead of teachers and parents, it should be, I believe, schools and parents. Because it's not just an individual teacher. What about it's educators? A, educators? That's great. Okay. That's just friendly. We're just going to accept that as friendly, yes. right? Okay. <laughs> We're not going to have a motion on top of a motion. All right. So all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So the amendment passes. Now we have the full statement. Any other discussion on the full statement? Seeing none, it has already been moved and seconded. No further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries 8-0. Cassandra, number three. Final one. Um, this is in regard to the education, evalu education educator <coughs> evaluation systems and the Senate Bill 103 in particular. It reads, the State Board of Education supports a fair and balanced educator evaluation system, typo. In order to realize this outcome, <coughs> Michigan needs a more consistent educator evaluation system based on consistent observation tools and practices, consistent approaches to determining student growth and incorporating growth measures into evaluation ratings, and the seamless integration of the evaluation process and outcomes with the identification and implementation of professional learning goals. The State Board of Education appreciates the governor and the state legislature for their work in commissioning and supporting the final report of the Michigan Council for Educator Effectiveness, headed by Dr. Deborah Ball, and for the ongoing efforts of both the House and the Senate to draft legislation in support of Michigan's educator evaluation efforts. The legislature currently is crafting and deliberating on Senate Bill 103. 
its latest version of amending the revised school code to improve the local teacher and administrator evaluation systems. The State Board of Education reaffirms its support for a final product that remains faithful to the consensus recommendations in the Ball Report of the Michigan Council for Educator Effectiveness. Any effort to shave off integral components of that report will weaken the fair and evidence-based evaluation strategies contained within it. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Where is there support? Four. Discussion, please. Michelle? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think um, you know, I would have a difficult time supporting this, um, although I do believe that um, the idea of it being a fair and balanced educator evaluation system uh, sort of it gets the, it the gets Fox at News it. of evaluation. Yeah, fair and balanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe. Might want to choose some other words. Yeah, really. Um, <laughs> but um, I think what is what would make it fair and balanced is a meaningful appeals process um, uh, to ensure that it's never abused um, or uh, to ensure that there's it's less likely to be abused. Um, um, I think when someone has a lot of power to determine someone's employment and that person doesn't have an opportunity to, um, to counter it, um, I think uh, that it sets up a dynamic where it can be abused um, and bias can set in. Um, it needs to, there needs to be checks and balances on it and um, and I I would like to include something that that we encourage it, it's not us it ha, you know it's legislated so it's not something that we control but I would like to support hope that we can support an idea that um, in in those cases um, where there's a potential for abuse that there's a means to address it uh, fairly for the person being um, evaluated um, so. I would like there to be a sentence that would be added that speaks to the the board encourages or encur the legislature. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. To the cut right cut to the chase. That's not good. No, 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 no. I'm just uh, and helpful. includes an appropriate uh, appeals, appeals process. process. So at the end of the for the second paragraph after goals is a comma, and it's so the sentence. Well. A long sentence. Uh, in order to realize this outcome, Michigan needs a more consistent educator evaluation system based on consistent observation tools and practices, consistent approaches to determining student growth and incorporating growth measures into an evaluation into evaluation readings, and seamless integration of the evaluation process and outcomes with the identification and implementation of professional learning goals, and that that includes an appropriate and that includes an appropriate appeals process. So are you making that motion, Michelle? Um, yes. A second. It, it's been moved and supported. This is just on the amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? Did you read it again? Did you read it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's the second paragraph, and it says, in order to realize this outcome, Michigan needs a more consistent educator evaluation system based on consistent observation tools and practices consistent approaches to determining student growth and incorporating growth measures into evaluation ratings, and the seamless integration of the evaluation process and outcomes with the identification of imp uh, and implementation of professional learning goals and includes an appropriate appeals process. It's been moved and supported. Pam, question? Yes. Um, maybe from the discussion that we had earlier this morning and you talked about the appeals process, is, is that going to come across as though that appeals process could occur within that school or does it have to be because you're talking about something uh, um, a little State bit more way. formal or that comes to MDE or yeah so maybe a um, independent yeah process. so I see what you're saying an independent uh, an, an appropriate appeals process by a you know, neutral third party or I don't know if it's let me see by an outside I don't know and maybe there's a a, a meaningful or effective yeah, appeals process, uh, appeals process. Um, but the idea is that it wouldn't be it would be somebody who's away from the, um, the environment who could come in and look um, 
of well, what's going on. I, Vanessa said meaningful appeals process. I don't know, but it. Third party? Yeah, I'm thinking third party, outside, independent. Yeah, I don't know. Independent. Yeah, I, yeah, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, I think that, that would improve it, I think. Okay, so let's vote down this amendment, okay. and then we're going to come up with another one, okay? Right. So that's easier than going and amending and amending and amending. Okay. So we have the motion on the floor. Come up with, they can accept the amendment. You know, yeah, I could have done a friendly vote. Well, if you're it willing to do that, that but that's not really Robert's rules. Oh, well. Yeah. So we say, We've never done it right before. A while. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to keep us on the narrow. <laughs> it's about, I'm it's trying to keep us on the narrow. Brian, Brian, hey, Brian, it's the maker of the vote. Thank you. The I've amendment. been waiting for this moment. For I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to keep us on the narrow. You know, these people are bored with parliamentary procedure. We'll help us with an amendment now. I yeah. would be willing <laughs> to no, accept. Yours. Yeah. Okay a okay. friendly okay. amendment that says meaningful. That says appropriate slash Independent or meaningful? Yeah. Independent third party. Um, M meaningful could be analyzed by anybody. So is there a party yeah, or independent? Yeah, independent. Independent is more objective. Independent. Okay. How's that? All right, that's a friendly amendment we're not going to vote on. Correct. She's accepting it. That's fine. That's good. All right. So now we have the original uh, motion, no, the amended motion, mm -hmm. right? First. The amended motion first. All those in favor of the amended motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Now we have the question on the adoption of the full recommendation. It's been moved, seconded. Any further discussion? <laughs> yeah. Can you read it? The full recommendation, which would be the rest of it. All right, so can we have one more reading of the full statement now? The entire statement or just, just the end? Just a second. Yeah. Wonder. Okay, go ahead, Kathleen. I have a, this, uh, Vanessa said this morning, very, 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 very well stated, that this is uh, the evaluation process is to improve the practice of teachers, good teachers even better. And I'd like to get that sentiment in this statement, that the evaluation process itself is to mm. improve it's a document. The evaluation process is, is not punitive. It's to improve the practice of teachers. We got it from this morning. Perhaps Kathleen, just the first sentence could read as it is and add something that, uh, that supports effective teaching and improve student learning per. Yeah, yeah. Students right here. Learning, but it doesn't say it's right here. Do what you want. Supports effective teaching and improves student right. learning is language that our it's the very team, front page. Uh, so we're adding an amendment that says at the end of the first sentence the purpose of educator evaluations is to support effective teaching and improve student learning mm -hmm. someone move that motion so it's that. already written down right here so moved and supported <laughs> <laughs> Everybody can read it on the front page. <laughs> All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion aye. carried. Uh, what's that? Aye. Aye. Seven one. All right. So now we need to reread the whole document, please. The State Board of Education supports a fair and balanced educator evaluation system. The purpose of educator evaluations is to support effective teaching and improve student learning. In order to realize this outcome, Michigan needs a more consistent educator evaluation system based on consistent observation tools and practices, consistent approaches to determining student growth and incorporating growth measures into evaluation ratings, and the seamless integration of evaluation process and outcomes with the identification and implementation of professional learning goals and includes an appropriate slash independent appeals process. The State Board of Education appreciates the governor and the state legislature for their work in commissioning and supporting the final report of the Michigan Council for Educator Effectiveness, headed by Dr. Deborah Ball, and for the ongoing efforts of both the House and the Senate to draft legislation in support of Michigan's educator evaluation efforts. The legislature currently is crafting and deliberating on Senate Bill 103, its latest version of amending the revised school code to improve the local teacher and administrator evaluation systems. 
The State Board of Education reaffirms its support for a final product that remains faithful to the consensus recommendations in the Ball Report of the Michigan Council for Educator Effectiveness. Any effort to shave off integral components of that report will weaken the fair and evidence-based evaluation strategies contained within it. Okay, it's been moved and it's been supported. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Motion carries 8-0. Cassandra, do you have anything else? That is it. All oh, right, um, Pam has something. Pam, yes. yes. Uh, should I just do say something about the ESEA? As soon as Pam is done. The, uh, Pam, is Pam is up, and then I'll call on you, Eileen. Kathleen. Kathleen. Yeah. Eileen, Kathleen. <laughs> you, you two shouldn't sit next to each other. I agree. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. They have, I think they have. Yeah. They have one. <laughs> the legislative <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. sent an email a week or so ago, but when after beta we got from the speakership, saying that this makes the prospects for ESEA revision passing much less. He said not only is Bain, has Boehner announced his resignation, but Chairman of uh, John Klein from the House Education and Labor Committee uh, has announced he's going to retire. He's not going to run for re-election, which, and he's been working to try to get the recalcitrant House members to uh, bend a little, I guess, <laughs> and support something that's, that's acceptable in the Senate. So the things don't look too positive now, especially now with the whole business with the Speaker. That's Maybe a new speaker will bring them together, but I don't, I'm not holding my breath. So uh, things don't look too positive at the moment. But maybe, maybe there'll be a turnaround. But that's the way it looked uh, a couple of days ago. Thank you, Kathleen. All right, Pam, you have the statement on Flint Water, please. Yes. So um, we talked about Flint Water. Actually, uh, we began our discussion um, in our state board uh, health edu education or health health subcommittee meeting and um, last week I put out a statement but it was for myself and it basically was circulated through social media and after further thought I thought that um, I wanted to put out a more formal um, statement uh, being with my background in environmental health um, educationally as well as my work experience most of my work experience has been around childhood lead poisoning and making sure that we reduce those levels, especially in our, our urban centers. Um, then after finding out, um, Superintendent Brian Whiston and I were at um, one of the schools that was just found to have an elevated um, level within the water system there at one of the schools. So I wanted to share this, and I think what I'll do is I will read it, and then I also have some proposals that I want to, to read on the back. So. Um, for the past 18 months, Flint residents have complained about the quality of their water and suspected health effects. They complained of hair loss, skin rashes, and even vomiting after drinking the water. Although their concerns were mainly disregarded by the state and city officials, a study by researchers at Flint's Hurley Medical Center substantiated their escalating fears and gave their plight national attention. This study, along with the water analysis by a Virginia Tech professor and a petition to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency provided the empirical evidence of rising childhood blood levels and revealed overlooked records of high lead levels in the city's drinking water. A wealth of research shows that even a small amount of lead in a child's body can cause serious health problems. Studies have demonstrated lead's compromising effects on the immune system in association with impairments and neurobehavioral factors such as child's learning skills, hearing, and self-regulatory ability resulting in delinquent behavior. According to the filed petition, Flint's drinking water also tested positive for total coliform, an indicator of possible sewage and fecal contamination. It is further noted that the city's treatment of the water to address the coliform resulted in elevated levels of a byproduct of disinfection, disinfection associated with liver, kidney, central nervous system problems, and increased risk of cancer. The assertions made by the residents, petitioners, and others has been proven and is now known that the water issues are linked to residents being moved from their water source of over 50 years from the Detroit Water and Sewage Department. 
to an inadequately examined water source and delivery system from the Flint River. It has also been confirmed that this decision was at the helm of new, numerous and differing emergency managers appointed by Governor Rick Snyder to fix Flint's budget problems. The budget fix tactics that have forced Flint's young children to drink lead laced water can contribute to their lower academic performance. Academic performance is a primary measure used to initiate state school districts or state takeover of Michigan schools. Additionally, a recent, a recent news report states that parents are pulling their children from Flint public schools at a loss of 300 more students than initially projected. This decline in enrollment would lead to a loss in school revenue and a greater budget deficit making easier for a state taker over a Flint public school. While Flint's poisonous water has shed light and callous decisions that continue to risk the health and well-being of our most vulnerable Michigan citizens, other low-income children are also casualties of such policies. After more than six years of failed state takeover style of governance, Detroit public schools' finances and academic outcomes have worsened. With a stabilized education system, destabilized education system, decreased academic outcomes, and increased deficit up for upward of $335 million. Governor Snyder, through executive orders and proposed legislation, continues an attempt to extend policies and an autocratic form of governance that usurps local control and power from Michigan residents. Unless we interject, areas in Michigan will continue to live under the threat of becoming U.S. sacrifice zones where costs are cut, budgets are balanced, and profits are made at the expense of the health and well-being of our children, especially our most burdened children living in low-income families. Therefore, I propose the following. MDE work with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to ensure that all Flint parents, guardians are offered bloodlet testing for their children at convenient locations, including schools. And I do believe Representative Sheldon Neely has already um, asked of this and if we could um, support that. The State Board of Education and State Superintendent of Instruction petitioned the SRO to halt pr processes that will lead to further state takeovers of schools and districts or formation of state districts. Number three, the State, of education, State Board of Education exhausts every effort to ter determine how to restore the adequate checks and balances set in place by our Constitution and stripped by Executive Order 2015-9 transferring the, SR, the school reform office and all accountability initiatives from the MDE to the Department of Technology Management and Budget. And this is signed by me. Hmm. That's a very powerful statement. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. And so I will email this so you have it. Can I ask a, a question? Mm -hmm. I had heard that um, in schools that were built uh, after 1985, have higher chances of leaching lead, and it might not just be contained in Flint, but throughout the state. Um, and so I didn't know if you had any data on that, if I heard that correctly, or? I don't have any data, but I know, and I work primarily in home, so I can speak from what I know, okay. is that every morning I get up and I flush my water system for about 32 seconds. And that is because water is, typic or, you know, water is typically acidic. Um, if there are no corrosion controls, I'm assuming that the pH could be even further off. But typically, if water stays overnight within a system, and there, there's typically like a buildup between the pipes and the water. So the water that is, sits overnight because of the acidity, then it can uptake that lead. The lead is in the solder of the pipe. So, and that is in housing built after, uh, built before 19, 1986, 85, 86. So I would imagine, I mean, there, there's things that we've always talked about to take um, proper precautions, but then when you don't have um, testing, adequate testing of the water as well as the system um, of that water. So I think in Flint, what they're seeing is not only that it was 1986 pipes, but it's also the um, corrosion controls and all of those things that are in place. So, I mean, you have to take all of those factors into consideration. So it may not be the fact that there's solder in the pipe, but it may be that whole water system. And so you have to test all of those things together. Right. That would be my answer. And I also was wondering, and Marty, maybe you, or Brian, maybe you can help me understand. So the MDE regulates um, the food that the kids eat. They're, are they somehow responsible for ensuring that children get 
food that is healthy and nutritious. Yes, I mean, we have federal requirements that we follow and make sure that schools meet those standards, and that's under Kyle's department. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm just wondering, so if a school, um, because I, I'm aware that there are other schools that have led. Um, so, so the regulatory framework is, so I know there's OSHA for employees, so that there's regulations on lead exposure there. Um, and MDE, if they're involved in the preparing of food to make sure, I would assume that there was some way, some regulatory way to control making sure that the food is healthy and not toxic. Um, but then also uh, DEQ, and I'm not really sure. So if, if a community, or let's say someone tests the water, because you can just buy these kits and have it done yourself, what is, what is the avenue to ensure that there'll be some, uh, that these issues will be addressed and what's, what process should be taken at, if, if, to go to a regulatory agency? If, it's, if you've already gone to folks and the administration and the board, and, and, there's, and by the way, there's a disincentive now because people will just choose to go someplace else, as you pointed out, and so there's an incentive to kind of keep it hush because people don't want to lose students because they'll lose funding. And, but um, so, so my question is, how, what, what regulatory agency is, are out there to address this? And how, and you know, where, where do they go? Where, do, where does a parent or teacher or whoever go? We're, we're going to be engaging with the other state departments, uh, working at the direction of the governor in terms of the other state departments, working to educate families and school districts on how they can go about testing, and, and the state will do the testing um, at a cost of, I think it's around $26 per test site. Um, so the state will do the, they'll do the testing, or you can take it to a private source. If a problem is found, then it's DEQ's responsibility to be involved because there are standards that have to be met in terms of the water quality. Just a quick for the water and for you mentioned food preparation. We have oversight of what we provide funding for school districts to prepare. So I think that's part of the child nutrition programs. We have oversight of whether or not they meet the nutritional guidelines. Now, in the case of food preparation, if there was salmonella or some other thing, you know, the health department is the one that has the, the means to test and the so authority the to shut an operation down, whether it's at a school or whether it's at an Applebee's. So it's DHHS? And, and DEQ. I mean, the, the, the local DHHS. public health department DHHS. is the one in this case to local? Okay. have the authority to say you can or can't do it. Sandra, please. I think that answered my question, but I just want to make sure when you said the testing of the site, you're talking about the water, not necessarily the children. Correct. Okay. Yeah. You're talking about what? You're talking. He's talking about testing the water, not necessarily testing the children. Because oh, yeah. I I agree that I think um, these parents need to know what they're dealing with at this point, and we should support if there's a piece of legislation that says the state is going to aid these families in having their children tested because there's going to be long-term impacts that they're going to have to start dealing with now. Um, I think the state should help these families in, in understanding what, what they're going to be presented with over the next right. lifetime of their child. Yeah, and so these, with the testing, there is testing that's done for Medicaid children, but it's at ages one and two, um, or if they've missed that 36 months and like 72 months. So some of these children may miss that mark. The other thing is that, um, so the age, I mean, if a child falls outside of that age, then they need to be provided the opportunity to be tested. And then the convenience of the testing, um, it needs to be something that we definitely consider having at, at the school sites or something where that's accessible to the children. And then one of the other issues with the testing of the water is how you test the water as well. So I mean, that was one of the issues with why there are discrepancies in numbers. So that's very, that's very important with the person who's doing the sampling. Um, not just um, the testing site, but how the testing is done. I remember taking three samples because that tells from which um, service line or where the problem could lie. And so you want to separate those out. You don't want to blend um, sampling. And then you also don't want to blend sampling from different areas within a community. Um, well, in that, that particular case, because some people, some households were not on that water source. So. So the, John? This
testing are we testing the community water supply or the school's water supply or both we would be responsible for educating on how to test at the school sites yeah. others yeah. would be accused of both when they're doing it by zip code but they're they tested specific schools as well because the health departments would not be testing for any type of heavy metal um, in food or water so that would have to be something that would be come from that would be something new um, I don't recall when I was there I don't know that that's happening now so is there any is there Shell? any oh, sorry I'm just alert. don't no go okay. Shell? um the so I know that there used to be um, resources for lead abatement lead identification um, I believe that in, in, in the school system if I understand right and like in Detroit but I don't believe I think those resources are gone um, and uh, my understanding is sort of like it's feeling like uh, you know that's kind of like the 80s and 90s it's, we're, we're right. past that now we're obviously not and, and as you point out the infrastructure um, uh, below the ground is even more uh, you know uh, suspect than above the ground um, so uh, are there resources for um, uh, you know, abatement, you know, I know Flint has drawn our attention and that deserves immediate attention, but I'm worried about other places across the state as well. Uh, and, and it's implication for student achievement. I mean, there's U of M did that study that shows it correlates exactly, you know, the more lead you have, the less well you do on standardized tests. It also affects your behavior, you know, so, um, so is there any programming out here within the department or uh, in this in statewide that anyone knows about that focuses not, on lead yeah, abatement? Not that we're aware of, but we will do some research and okay. get back to you. Most of it was federal funding from CDC or HUD. Um, and so that funding has dwindled. Some of the programming has uh, gone away. Um, state funding that was allocated, I, I believe, um, has, has dwindled as well. All right. And it was competitive. I mean, each community has to write for that grant. And thank you, Kathleen. Please. I, I think it's it's likely that uh, schools in uh, Detroit that are older. There are some new schools in Detroit, but in Hamtramck, I don't think there's been a new school since 1930. <laughs> Unless something went up in the last couple of years that I missed. Because a lot of schools around the state that are were built. In the so, you know, it's likely that this is going to be an expensive proposition. And as I was pointing out, the state's going to have to step up to this somehow. I mean, the schools are one thing, but it's everything below ground that carries water that is well, very. Well, that's what I mean. But those are probably yeah. lead pipes. Of those, they're old everywhere. They're old. And in Detroit, they're yeah, like I don't have and they're in falling Park. apart. And the problem, right. if I understand, is listening to the, in in. Switching over, they didn't get the anti-corrosion treatment right, and so <coughs> old pipes are everywhere. And if you somehow aren't getting your treatment right to prevent the lead corrosion, right. it Hopefully just is the there. Hopefully, the Detroit water system has been doing it right, so it won't be a problem. Well, their water apparently is a little different too, I guess. But it's you know that's, that's the potential really is, is quite <laughs> huge. We'll have to face I, up to that. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. What was your motion? What I said earlier, um, the State Board of Education supports legislation that ensures all Flint parents and guardians are offered blood lead testing for their children at convenient locations, including schools, provided by the state. Question? Mm -hmm. are, is, is any, are we doing that now with the joint interagency governor led? We're certainly testing. testing the water. I don't know if we're testing individuals. I don't people. think I know that um, Representative Sheldon Neely has has proposed that this happen. I don't know where they are. I, well, I spoke with him, and I know that they've. I don't think that they've they've moved on that. Eileen, please. I, I would say urges. Supports because legislation. It, it, I said it, well, support, I don't know. Sorry. I don't know that this legislation. I don't know if it's needed. There could be other health authorities that will have to do this in a matter of, of uh, as a course of doing business for so, public safety. So I would say urges. Right. Urges the legislature. No, just urges that the state uh, that the proper authorities. Uh, uh, could be the public health department that right. should be could do this, and this is yeah. a question of doing it. So urges the state, right? Urges without the state. The state. Yeah. 
Okay. I think that that will move it faster. Yeah. All right. Can you read it now again, please? Hold on. Okay. I think I have this. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. The State Board of Education urges the state and 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 proper authorities. Uh, or other proper to, authorities. Maybe. Or other proper authorities. To offer uh, blood lead testing for Flint children at convenient locations, including schools funded by the state. Or you could just say free of cost, free of charge. And someone has to pay for it. That's right. So. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a. Was that moved? Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on it? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Is that it, Marty? Anything else from your end? <laughs> Sandra said no. <laughs> You're saying no. So then I'm going to move back to approval of minutes. Uh, approval of minutes of the regular committee of the whole meeting of September 8, 2015. We'll move. Been moved. Is there support? Been moved and supported. Any discussion? You can read that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. O O's the same. Uh, I have another report. Motion Ground carried. Uh oh, what? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Oh. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay, the next item is K. The next item on today's agenda is approval of changes to organizational representatives on the Special Education Advisory Committee. There are three education organizations have requested changes for the representatives on the committee. These organizations are Michigan Association of School Psychologists, Michigan Association of Non-Public Schools, Michigan Elementary and Middle School Principals Association. Board approval is being requested today. Norma Jean and Terry, or Norma Jean? Just me for now. Um, basically what this is within all of the three, um, the psychologists, the non-public schools and the um, elementary and middle school principals association the assistant the delegate for whatever reason the delegate was resigned or took a new position and therefore the alternate went up to become the delegate and then an assist an alternate was put in their place does that make sense yep mm -hmm. So is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved and supported. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same? Motion carries 7-0. Kathleen's not in the room. Okay, the next item on today's discussion action agenda is the approval of fiscal year 2015-16 camp <laughs> Tasma. Ida? Tess Mahita? Camp T. Camp T. Tess Mahita. We're just going to go with Camp T. Yeah. At the September 15, 2015 Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund Committee meeting, members Michelle Fecta and Kathleen Strauss reviewed the fiscal year 2015-16 spending plan for Camp T, which we refer to as Camp T. These items is being presented to the full board for approval at today's meeting. We have Kyle and Jane. And Colette is joining us. Hi. Kyle? Thank you. Uh, as you know, the uh, board members, uh, Fechtow and, and Strauss, are on the, on the committee and, and met, I think, two weeks ago now to go over the Sunny plan. And I guess just for, um, for everyone's, everyone's on the same page, kind of a quick what Camp T is. Um, Camp Tuscanita, Camp T is uh, uh, originally was a camp for visually impaired students and now we've been using the camp for um, any school ch child and um, we have other groups that go there too it's a wonderful facility uh, if anybody ever wants to see it it's actually it's a beautiful camp and we use trust fund money to pay for the maintenance and for all the activity well the activities and things we do charge a little bit for food it helps offset some of the cost of food it's all funded with um, trust fund money, and the board sets the the budget every year. So we're here to try to get approval for the budget, and the can uh, the trust fund committee already approved our recommendation. So, is there any questions on Camp T? 
Seeing none, is there a recommendation to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and supported. Any further discussion? Can you say thanks, John? To Michelle and Thank Kathleen you. for um, representing us and taking good care of me. Well, I'd like to in invite or urge all the board members to go visit CAD T. It's, uh, it's an amazing place. It's just amazing to see visually impaired students oh. doing the things that they're doing there. And it's, it's very exciting to see it. And the camp has come a long way since my first visit to it, which was probably uh, 20 years ago, maybe. And it's really, it, it's really been improved a lot, and it, it, this trust fund has been the, the, the source of the improvements. So, uh, and the staff is doing a great job, there, so it really is good. And it'd be great. I, I think we should be going around the, to visit well, our meetings in other places, and maybe one of them could be a camp team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I would. Shell? I it's wonderful, and I, I'd like to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's ways to um, let even more you know, schools know about this. I don't know, sort of, your teachers' network or others. But I, I, I also love how it is, um, you know, it, it, it takes special care for kids with all different types of abilities and it's incredibly thoughtful and, and making. Um, experiences that a lot of kids wouldn't get otherwise um, at, and having it available at this camp. I mean, it just seems like kids across the state should know about it. I would also like to see um, for us to consider having our retreat next year there, if that's possible, and so we can uh, so we can see it. That's a great idea. And then uh, actually be out in, in nature, commuting, like a, like a real retreat. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> like a real retreat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's been moved and supported. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Motion does carry. Thank you. Next up is consent agenda. Are there any items the board wishes to have removed from the consent agenda prior to the vote? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose the same. Motion carries. Comments by State Board of Ed members. We have had no comments today, so I'm sure you have some. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking of voting on what did we do that just now? John, did you, there was some notion that we would add the... Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. We're going to vote on something this afternoon. Uh, right, the moratorium, moratorium on teacher. On teacher. Yeah. You can make a motion to do that. Well, we continue the moratorium you, as recommended. Moved and supported oh. to add and the no continual <laughs> three-year <laughs> moratorium. <laughs> three years on teacher prep institutions. We had a presentation on that at the beginning of today's meeting. Is there a move and support? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose the same. And I'll remind the board that we will tell you if we get an application so that you can continue to have the discussion if you so choose. Okay. Comments for our board members? Yes, Michelle, please. Okay. I, I um, just wanted to um, follow up on the uh, some concerns that that I've received and I think others have received about the online uh, social studies text. Um, uh, I know uh, it seems like a lot of work and I've heard the people who testified have gone into working on the standards and, and I believe that the text, the online text, <coughs> a separate process with, uh, that were conducted with the grants from, um, from MDE and our available resource uh, on the site. Um, I would ask that um, there be um, consideration of, um, uh, you know, uh, doing some heavy revisions of this, uh, possibly suspending the um, the books online until those revisions are made. Or, um, uh, but I think there's it needs um, you know, a number of uh, some very serious, um, uh, you know. Uh, errors have been raised. Now, I haven't looked to compare to make sure that the what's being said to me is, you know, I haven't looked at the text thoroughly myself. 
but I, I they've been from some pretty credible sources, and um, I think we have to, um, you know, we want to make sure that people are getting, that students are getting accurate uh, information and um, and uh, further um, and focused review on those texts uh, are, should be should be done. So I will turn it over to Linda in a second, but I do want to remind the board that people, if they do find errors in those books, right on that book, uh, there's opportunities for them to share those errors so that they can be corrected immediately. This is not a department book. It is just something that we're making available as a resource, but we do want anything we provide to be accurate. With that said, Linda, do you have some additional? So it's accurate that this is a part of the TRI grant, the Techn uh, Technology Readiness Infrastructure Grant? It was a six six hundred thousand dollars was put aside to do some of this work. Three hundred thousand dollars has been How expended much? in this project. Three hundred thousand. Um, state educators from across the state have participated in the development of this uh, project, and it is a resource for teachers by teachers. Uh, so, to the degree that teachers have credibility in what they want to present and what they see as useful tools, this process did cover that. There is an online, as, as Brian said, there is an online opportunity to make corrections uh, to the text where they're found. For me, in my limited knowledge of all of this, um, it kind of feels like a wiki situation where if you find something on a wiki page, you can you know, write in and make corrections and ask for those corrections to be considered. That process is being followed. Um, as of a week and a half ago, there had been one request for a change that request had been pages long by one of the people that was a part of the, the article in the paper this morning. And those changes are being looked at to determine if there are changes that need to be made based on that information. Um, I wouldn't deny that we want to have something that's accurate. This is, number one, not a curriculum. Number two, not a textbook in the sense of a book that you can order. It is a resource for teachers to use as they see fit. There have been, as of uh, I think earlier this week, I think yesterday, as of yesterday, over um, 55,000 downloads around the world and at a cost savings to school districts of over $5 million. I want accurate material in front of them. I'm not disputing that at all, but I am saying that this has been widely accepted and is being used by educators across the state. Is, um, is there, was there a pilot project or before it was given out to everyone? Yes. What, what, where, so it was piloted last academic year? Or? No, it was piloted, well, yeah, the end of last academic year and over the summer with feedback from educators asked for before they ever went public. Okay, but it, didn't, it wasn't like it was just uh, available to a few districts to sort of pilot the, the texts and to see if they were, if there were any, because, you know, you can, there are a lot of materials for the text online. To the content was made available to a limited number of districts. And, and educators to take a look at the veracity and correctness. There were suggestions for change before this went public this fall. Well, we, we want it to be accurate, so if you can forward to Linda uh, those information you've got, we will make right. sure it's Absolutely. it's taken care of. Can you send us out the link to the... Sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking for that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Michelle, and then I'm going <laughs> to call on Eileen. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, one of the, the concerns that I had heard is that there was not a, and hopefully I'm getting, that, that the same people who put this together were the, was pretty much the same people who vetted it before it went out. Like it wasn't um, like a different group to sort of independently look at it with fresh eyes. It was sort of the same people looking at it again. And, and, and that was brought up as a, as a concern. I'll double check for you. My understanding is that it was a fresh set of eyes. In fact, one of the people who was, um, uh, quoted or has been alluded to in the article today was asked to serve as an, in an editorial role for the document and following negotiations between the, all the parties to decline okay. for a variety of reasons. All right, Eileen, please. Boy, I am struggling with this because I've been a huge proponent of online resources for teachers and open sourcing. And uh, at the same time, I, I think because it's an outgrowth of what we're trying to do, um, I wish it hadn't been released before the social studies standards had uh, been uh, approved, because now I believe it's tarnishing what we're trying to do with the, with the standards themselves. I think it's, uh, and I'm you know listening to how many downloads there are, thinking how many of those are people curious because they wanted to see how interesting the, 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 the books were. 
So I don't know what the solution is, but I think that um, uh, to uh, in the future, for sure, if we're going to have a project like this, it can't be done in advance of the standards being approved. Because if there's errors in the standards that we're trying to correct, the process for vetting this document is going to take more time or money, more volunteer time by people who aren't necessarily qualified to be writing textbooks, which is a different skill than even designing curriculum or being in the classroom. And I appreciate the passion that went into this. I just think we're going to have to be very thoughtful and careful about what we do in the future. And I don't know how to fix this. Duly noted. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. I myself am with Eileen. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lean <laughs> corner. <laughs> no, we're not worried. We like it. Yeah. All right. I do need to go back to Kyle on the Flint water. What uh, What do you know? So quick, based on the conversation I reached out to my uh, colleague uh, at Health and Human Services, and they are working with the health department to put testing protocols in place for students and the line of community partners to do that work and that they're hoping to start doing the testing for the next two weeks. Thank you. Boy, look at the board passes a motion and look what happens. Well, we yeah. are powerful. <laughs> <laughs> All good work by a lot of people is going on. <laughs> All right. Uh, any tentative agenda for the next meeting? If there's anything board members would like to have on that, please let John, Cassandra, Michelle, Marilyn, or myself know, and we'll make sure those get put on. Future meeting dates, November 10th, 9.30, December 8th, 9.30, and Tuesday, January 12th, 9.30. So all Tuesdays, November 10th, December 8th, January 12th, are our next meetings. And with that, we are adjourned.